that's just his little leash I, I have in my DIY lizard leash. It works amazing, especially for him because he hates me when he's only when he's outside. He will snuggle up against me every time I'm near him inside. And that's, I can't look at the camera now because he will bite the shit out of me. But uh, when I put him outside, he just uh, he goes beast mode and. I guess I become a predator and he just wants to escape. Inside he's just, he snuggles up with me. If I put him on my chest while I'm working on the computer, he would just like fall to sleep, fall asleep on me and he's very lovable. But outside he just kind of, he goes beast mode. So, um, it's a great shot of his mouth. And that stuff does hurt. I've, I've been bitten before feeding him. It's okay, bud. Yeah, I'm not Steve Irwin. You're not going to bite me in the nose. I'm not trying to be nice to him, but, I mean. Alright, so, you told, what are you, you going to be mean now? Because I got the camera out. So, it's been, like, a few weeks, basically, since I started letting him out. And he's about to be grumpy with me, but he's been really, really nice the past few times I've done this with him. He didn't really run away. Like two seconds ago, he was enjoying being petted, but now not. So now he's gonna run away. So yeah, but this is the current setup. Works well. Have not had a single issue uh, doing this. Um, and slowly but surely, he's uh, kind of warming up. So it's nice. He enjoys going out. So chickens are doing the same thing as always. They're just being chickens. Did you girls enjoy the scraps? Huh? Did you like the corn? Can I... Don't, don't peck me. Go. Go away. Let me get that. You go. You go. Is that it? There's, give me that other one. Get that one right there. I want that one. I want to put it in the compost pile. Alright guys, so we are at 700 plus subscribers, so I do want to, you know, say a quick thank you to all of my new, current, and old subscribers. I really appreciate it. Um, you guys are uh, you guys are the reason why I make these videos. Um, not just to be on YouTube and not for the monetization, um, but sharing and growing and being part of the community. So uh, thank you guys for subscribing. That number to me is kind of, you know, that number and how many numbers, you know, pop up on the views and also the comment section are, are really the numbers that, that drive me to continue to make these videos. Um, the whole community aspect is a very valuable thing to me. Um, I consider a lot of you friends and I really wish I didn't live in Dallas. So I wouldn't even say that we all live closer. I just that I didn't have to live in Dallas then maybe I could live somewhere better than Dallas. I just don't think our fish culture here is a very good one. There are definitely some amazing people here but they're kind of spread out so uh, it's rare to find you know good fish friends in my area. So that's what YouTube you know really just kind of comes in and holds me over so I get to you know mix and mingle with all of you in the comment section below and that really means a lot to me so thank you guys for that I do appreciate it that being said I do want to call the, um, the giveaway here at 700 and to quote what I had said earlier in a previous video uh, for the 500 subscriber giveaway I would give away three packages to three people and uh, for every 100 subscribers over 500, I would ship out one more. So being at 700, it's a total of five packages. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll cover how I'm gonna do the giveaway and how you can kind of uh, basically win or apply to win um, more towards the end of the video. So right now for the video, what I'm gonna go ahead and cover are uh, an outside project that I've got going. It's going quite well and um, a very, a, a much more affordable way to do something in the fish room. Actually two much more affordable ways to do something in the fish room. Um, so I'm also gonna be covering fertilizers that I use as well. So anyways, 
Let's go ahead and we'll cut to those. Am I in shot now? Oh, I think I'm in shot, right? I'm in shot, okay. So, basically, um, what I do is daily in like this 100 gallon here and this green water 55 that I've got to get, I've got to get, you know, figured out. Um, I do chelated iron daily. Um, I do my micros daily and um, my macros daily. So uh, you don't need the chelated iron. I just do it because I want to really try and bring out reds in my plants and ensure that I've got more than enough iron. I do believe um, these micros, which is Miller's Micro Complex from uh, Nilo Sheet G Aquatics, does have iron in it. So you don't need to dose iron unless you have a plant that requires it or you just want to. I noticed my plants do a little bit better with it, and I, at least I think I do. So, um, But really what I want this to be about is how a lot of you can save money in the hobby. It's an expensive hobby, as we all know, especially when you start diving into plants and you throw on, like, you, you spend a hundred, a couple hundred bucks on, like, a CO2 system, and then you figure out that little pump bottle, whatever you got, is not enough. Some of those pump bottles, actually, I do need to take it back. Aquarium Co-ops um, Thrive from Nilo CG Aquatics and Vital from Justin at H2O Plants, all are strong enough for a highlight CO2 tank. All of them will work. You just have to pump more. Um, and Nilo CG Aquatics has Thrive, which I think is his most comprehensive one. It's got micros, macros, like a good concentration. The guy's a chemist. So I trust him and I trust his math. Uh, Justin from H2O Plants and uh, Lucas from LRB Aquatics both trust him as well. But um, I kind of want to dive into some of the stuff that I use. I don't get everything from him. I do get my equations uh, from him because I, I trust them. And if I could afford to get everything from him, I would. And the reason I can't at the moment is I'm running out of stuff quite quick, quickly because I, I think I'm just dosing. I need to switch over to EI perhaps instead of the uh, Pro Preservation System. But anyways, I'm gonna set some of this down. We can just kind of go over it. Uh, some of the things you get from him, this is uh, KNO3 Potassium Nitrate. I get all these out. I get all my jars out and kind of go over my mixture so you guys know. And uh, I'll put links in the description so you can um, check out his site and um, see for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of money you can save doing a planted aquarium. It really doesn't have to be expensive. Your ferts don't. Your ferts do not have to be expensive. Uh, so for my Miller's Micro Complex, which I, don't, I took everything out of the bags and put it into here because I thought it would be better. Um, the Miller's Micro Complex, uh, two bags of KNO3, and then a bag of K2SO4 potassium sulfate, KH2PO4 mono potassium phosphate. Uh, so that's your potassium, that's your phosphate, that's your nitrate, which also has potassium in it. I want to say mono potassium, um, mono potassium phosphate. I mean, these all are potassium based uh, chemicals. So they all have potassium in them. But for all of that there, I want to say I paid $32 after shipping. So even though I had to pay shipping, it was still like under, it was like $32 now. And I haven't ran out of this. And I've been dosing a 125, 275s, multiple 55s now, and this 100 and a 40 breeder daily, like a daily. And I'm getting low on my K2SO4 potassium sulfate. Um, part of that is due to how much I dose in my uh, with my PPS method. So my KNO3 uh, for this 500 mil bottle to dose one mil per 10 gallons. Um, I mix in 32.5 grams that I measure with my gram scale here of potassium nitrate. Um, and then this is really faded, but uh, and all this stuff is on Nilo's, you know, dosing calculations and stuff. So it's very easy to go find this. Uh, then my K2SO4, which is the one I'm almost out of. You didn't get a lot. This is really for an EI method. If it was EI, I would be dosing. I wouldn't be like 
you know, almost out of one and then, you know, half full on others. But uh, for the K2SO4, 29.5 grams. The KH2PO4, uh, 3 grams. And at that, the KH2PO4, literally the only reason you're adding that is to top off your potassium. Um, considering there's so much potassium in the nitrate and phosphate um, mixtures of, of your fertilizer that you're making, uh, the only reason you even need the K2, uh, KH2PO4 is to just bring that up to a full EI level, which is an estimated index level. Um, not necessary, but it just brings your potassiums up to a higher, better level, which all really does depend on your aquarium. So you can adjust this as you need. I've made mine stronger. Others can make their weaker in certain areas. You can add less nitrates and more phosphates, uh, more potassium, less phosphates, however you need it to work. Now figuring out how to do that stuff is gonna just take time, trial and error, and uh, also talking to some rather smart people like uh, like Justin from H2O Plants or Nilo CG himself. You can get a hold of them, I think, on Facebook. But um, I also add to this uh, 20.5 grams of MgSO4, which is just Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Um, so it's pretty easy to get Epsom salts. I just I just go to you know a health store or a pharmacy and get some. Walmart has it. Um, so that's how I make that, and I dose that at one mil per ten gallons. Now for my micros, basically I have Miller's Micro Complex here. And I just mix that at a rate of uh, 40 grams per 500 mils. I actually have, uh, I got some more. So the micros I, I, are one thing I don't know or even kind of trust to get from anywhere else. Um, I'm sure there's a few places they could other than Nilo that would have it for aquariums. But Nilo is just known well in our hobby by a lot of people. I mean, Justin and Lucas trust him. Uh, I, I just feel safe going to him. I feel like... You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get what I pay for, and I'm also gonna get customer service because he's he's a hobbyist, not like some giant corporation. So you always get more communication out of those people. If you ever had a problem, uh, you could you know you can actually get the truth out of someone versus a corporation. They'll, they'll you know they kind of dance around things. It's like they have to ask a lawyer before they answer a question. So it's always great to talk to a person instead of a corporation. Um, but uh, I've also got the Plantex CSM Plus B, which is what Justin and Lucas use. So I wanted to try this. I think this costs like a couple dollars more than the Miller's Micro Complex, and I don't really know the difference. But uh, I just wanted to give it a try and see if I liked it. But I got, I think it was like uh, twelve dollars each for each one of these and it will last me a fairly long time so it's like 24 I want to say I paid twenty nine dollars seven dollars for shipping so you know let's say 29 I want to say I paid 29 maybe it was like 32 though something like that but for a half pound of micros not that bad I mean we're talking I have a lot of big tanks here that I dose heavily daily which is somewhat unnecessary if if and when I switch to the EI method, I think I'd be saving a lot of FERTs because I can just dose a full amount every other day on something like this instead of, you know, I really haven't done the math. So, but the point here is there's a lot of money that you can save on FERTs. If you have a 55 or a 100 or a 125, this is going to save you a lot of money because it could very well last you six months. For $32, you can get a complete EI dosing method, um, and he has DIY EIs to where you can buy 500 mil bottles, and it's got instructions on on how to pre-mix it for multiple tanks, which I should be doing. I'm just lazy, so I do one thing until I basically, out of necessity, have to do something else and learn something else. So when I have to learn something, it takes time, and generally I make mistakes which cost me money, so learning stuff sometimes can be a bit of uh, a bit of a job for me. Alright, it is pretty hot in my fishing, I had to turn that fan up. Um, 
I just got a couple of fans on the walls to circulate air a little bit better in here. But um, yeah, so that's my current setup. Now from him you can even add, this is chelated iron that is in a different percentage rating. It does have some nitrogen in it. So it has 6% nitrogen, 13.2% iron. Um, all of that iron means chelated iron. So this is just something I got off of eBay that I wanted to try. I had no idea I would use it as much as I am. So that being said, I may consider getting my next amount from Nilo if I can get it in a large enough quantity. But um, I would recommend that you get your stuff from Nilo. Unless, I mean, you're like me and you're trying to dose thousands of gallons in a day. I'm, I'm fairly close to over a thousand gallons a day that I dose. Um, I'm probably right around a thousand, so, and that's daily. So, uh, I go through stuff a little bit faster, so I try and save a little bit of money. But otherwise, it could cost me a lot. Um, so, that's my iron, and I, I mix that. Uh, and Nilo's recommended levels on his website. I think his website is also listed for a different uh, concentration of, of uh, chelated iron. Um, and I don't know that his has nitrates in it either. So uh, 16.3 grams per 500 mils, um, I believe is what his website lists. Definitely go check that for yourself. Now, a couple other things that I've got here. Um, this is calcium carbonate. This is just, I, I grabbed five pounds of powder um, and basically what I do with that is I just started doing this because I ran out of my API calcium for marine. Um, and API has 3.25% to 4.25% of deionized water, so RODI, and calcium chloride. You can go get calcium chloride at Walmart and little small containers in your pickling section. It's there to make pickles crisper when you bite into them. I have no idea how that works in mixing them with your aquariums. I do know that calcium carbonate, literally what this comes from is limestone. So literally they just grind down limestone like chalk rock and uh, you're left with like 100% calcium carbonate. So uh, I'm not sure the true process on it, but pure, it's natural, and it's organic, so I feel a lot safer dosing that into my snail tanks. And that's generally, you know, I may put it into a crayfish tank, I'll put it and uh, I use it, I use it out for my chickens as well. If I feel that their eggs are getting a bit weak, um, I'll actually sprinkle some onto their food, and I've noticed that that hardens up their eggs very, very fast. Um, but this is something I'll also put in uh, my ram's horn breeding tank or my uh, marbled crayfish breeding tank considering there's so many uh, invertebrates living in those tanks that just depend heavily on having hard calcified water for their shells to sustain being hard and i want those shells to be hard for my puffer so that he's not biting into soft shelled creatures whose shells aren't very strong so snails can withstand you know, high amounts of calcium and it definitely benefits them. So I will, you know, go heavy on this stuff. And that's a snail only tank, just snails. And I've noticed it helps out a lot for my snails because when you're feeding heavily and they're just producing all this waste, it can acidify and kind of eat at their shells fairly quick if there's not a good buffer in there. So I do also use uh, crushed coral in my snail only tanks. So they have something to graze on, but this just kind of guarantees me on day five or seven of a water change, after a water change, that I have calcium in there for their shells to stay strong. All right, so I also want to go over a few fish that I have been able to successfully breed. See if we can get in here and see these guys. Uh, there you go, you can see them. They're pretty small. Uh, what these are are uh, pearl danios. So the parents are in here. Um, and I really like the parents. I think they look they look neat. They've got like a blue sheen It's almost iridescent to them and the way you can tell the difference between the pearls and the rose Danios is the rose Danios do look very similar, but they don't have that stripe on the uh, like the caudal uh, the caudal fin so these ones have a stripe kind of on their right on their tail and uh, the rose rose Danios do not uh, now they have like 
like a blue iridescence with like this nice red underbelly and I think they look really cool they're also really easy to breed so um, basically I've got one big fat pregnant female in there I don't know if I have any other females or not what my ratios are but she's pregnant enough to breed so all I did was I threw in a floating mop and I actually threw in two after like about a week of quarantining, two weeks of quarantining um, because basically I feed all my fish really well, fed them a lot of live foods, probably not necessary because they're Danios. Left these in there for five days, pulled them out, saw eggs, and uh, went ahead and set up this little breeder box, threw them in here, and about three days later they hatched. So this is my hatch date, 611, or my pull date, I don't even know to be honest. But um, we're at 619 today, so um, that's how, how, how small they are, like about eight, eight days later, a week later. Um, pretty small, they're not able to eat brine. I feed them microworms a couple times a day because uh, that's all I basically have to offer them. I actually did order some vinegar eels that will arrive. Um, hopefully rather soon that way I could feed something like microworms are great but if you overfeed the microworms they're gonna die and basically rot a lot faster versus um, vinegar eels kind of won't die in there so they will eventually die I'm sure but they uh, they have a greater chance to live a lot longer and thus they have a greater chance of being eaten by your fish so I have no idea how many fry in here are in here probably not a lot I'm pretty sure these are going to become one of my outside projects um, which I'm, I'm pretty happy about that I do like the fish a lot um, they, they you know I really didn't care for them that much when I first got them but they've been growing on me so uh, I do like the way they look and they're they're fairly easy to spawn if you weren't going to do outside summer tubbing that's you know heavily vegetated and has tons of algae for the babies to feed off of and hide in um, you can easily you know mop spawn them pull the mops and put them in another cycled tank and eventually uh, rear up the fry like that and feed them something like micro rims and vinegar eels as a first food uh, so anyways we're going to go ahead and move on all right, so this is a new tank while we're on the topic of breeding fish this is a new tank um, at least a, a newly set up one and what I have in here is a breeding pair of electric blue rams now I'm a complete noob when it comes to electric electric blue rams um, but they were paired off in the store these two you know my male was colored up vibrantly and uh, they were basically chasing everybody away from a little spot they had basically you know made theirs in their tank and uh, I went ahead and bought them the male was I mean he looked ill he looked like his stomach was very very swollen which I'm pretty sure is common for rams uh, the males and the fish in general can get a swollen stomach if you feed them too much blood worms so basically he's been on they've been on a diet of nothing but frozen brine shrimp uh, some mice shrimp in there and then I think I threw in some baby brine shrimp as well um, and they're also getting QT meds. I actually, dang it, I think I forgot to dose General Cure yesterday. Isn't that wonderful? I wanted to give them a, co a course of General Cure and I forgot to do it yesterday. But either way, he's doing a lot better. Um, his swelling went down either yesterday or this morning. And I only got them like a few days ago. But, um... The swelling has gone down. They're hard to see because this tank, as you can see, is black watered out. So, um, like I did a quick rescape on this tank, moved out the inhabitants, and uh, threw in some catapa leaves and um, a little elder, elder acorns, whatever they're called. You guys know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> um, and just a couple catapa leaves. So it's black watered out. Hopefully, I did that because I knew they were a breeding pair, and he. I mean, they both looked amazing. They're in breeding dress, but he had the swollen stomach, and I wanted him to do as good as possible while I medicated him. And, you know, I, I threw in a ton of catapa leaves, and then, you know, general cure erythromycin, ICX, and then just fed brine shrimp. So that seemed to do it. I do probably still need to, f um, to be treating with 
General Cure and possibly Erythromycin. Now, General Cure does kind of have, uh, you know, metronidazole and prazi, which metronidazole can serve as an antibacterial in some cases. But um, I probably need to continue those, you know, at least a General Cure treatment for him to make sure he doesn't get any type of internal infections. I may even feed, I do have a frozen um, canamycin metronidazole food which may just be perfect for him if he's got the swollen issue and it is a brine shrimp uh, but it's it's made for marine fish but it works for you know freshwater fish as well so I may feed him that you know that should help him I mean tremendously but anyways they're doing good I don't think we're gonna see him it's just too dark um, somebody's back there in the corner swimming up and down probably not good probably stressing them out so I'm gonna go ahead and get away and then I'll check on them here in a few Alright, moving on male betta doing good I've got him in here with the female betta um, she generally hides in the coconut because he's a bit of a grumpy pants but um, these two are doing good here she's got black she's starting to color up again so I really hope she does get some color to her um, Parkinsone doing amazing I, I, at this point, I'm waiting. Um, I see stringy poop. Yep, I see stringy poop. Let's keep an eye on that. One of them's got stringy poop, which uh, they actually just got done with a treatment of Proziquantanol. I'll probably go ahead and run them through Levamisol um, as well, and probably Levamisol and Canamycin or something. Um, it can be really wise to treat with an antibacterial when you go to deworm because often fish will get uh, an internal infection as you're deworming because they have these parasites attached to their internal, you know, internal organs and stuff that you're killing so those internal parasites can release toxins as they are killed. So it can be very valuable to dose antibacterials uh, so that they don't get an infection. But anyways, speaking of rainbow fish, this is where my pride and joy is right now. And um, what these are, are my blue gold Blair eyes. So right there, my male and my female that I picked up four weeks ago. Um, as a test, I went ahead and I threw in a spawning mop. About four to five days later, I checked it. It was full of eggs. I had no idea it had this many eggs. I mean, you guys, there's got to be over a hundred babies in there. Like, it's not picking them all up for you. You can kind of see what I'm talking about there. You see how many are just kind of like right here in this area? But it, it goes all the way back. And it, this 10-gallon this is just packed with babies. There's got to be 50 to 70 minimum fry in there now. And uh, different ages, different sizes. So there are little ones that can't eat brine that get fed just microworms and there are bigger ones that are eating brine now so uh, they're getting fed brine daily a couple times a day and um, also I'm feeding microworms along with my brine which I'm actually gonna do now since I'm sitting here with them um, I'm sorry for the shot and I just try and stir it up so it gets evenly dispersed around the tank because there's literally just a lot of them throughout the tank so I do need it to get a good even dispersal and they're just gonna enjoy those for a little while um, I'm also feeding them Hakari first bites it's it's small enough for them um, I don't know if it's small enough for the newborns to be honest I, I have the microworms ready to go so as soon as I saw them I was feeding microworms and they were eating it so uh, I don't know if Hakari is as small as microworms but this is a very small food, so this is something, you know, good to have on hand if uh, you're going to be breeding um, your rainbows. But, I mean, they're doing really, really well. They're growing fairly fast. Um, once they're big enough to net out, I'm probably going to put them in a much larger tank. Uh, 50, I mean, 30 or 40 gallon being the smallest. That being said, if you want to grow something out, you want to feed it more, the bigger the better. So they may even, uh, they may even end up in the uh, 125 there, who knows? Um, definite possibility. Um, all I know is I'm very, very just, I'm really happy. I really hope that I get all of these to adulthood. And uh, it would just be amazing 
to go from two fish that I paid $18 a piece for at my local fish store to, you know, a hundred fish. It, it, would, it would just be amazing. A hundred, a hundred rainbows, all the same type. Um, so shout out to Dwayne. Dwayne has one type of these, one old grumpy male. If I'm able to get these to survive into adulthood and do well for me, I'm, uh, I'm gladly going to ship out Dwayne, a female companion for his male. Uh, as soon as I have, you know, uh, inch, inch and a half fish, that way his, uh, his male doesn't have to be lonely. Um, and he can have a companion for a, uh, a little while. But uh, I'm very happy. And I do want to show you how small these fish are. These aren't like full adults. He doesn't have the big hump on his head. And this guy will absolutely develop that. So breeding age for rainbows is like colored up, rate, uh, colored up age. They don't have to be, um, they don't have to be, you know, giant beasts to be breeding. Um, so, I mean, I brought these guys home from the fish store and they were a bit larger. Um, brought them home from the fish store and within a few weeks they were spawning for me. So I actually have another mop in there. That's truly just a test. I want to see if they will raise their fry. I kind of don't have anywhere else. Like when I did that, I was like, oh shit, there's fry in there. What do I do? And I just moved the parents one tank over and um, yeah. So I, I, honestly, you know, putting a mop like that into a 10 gallon is not a good idea. I should have put that into like, I mean, it's easier to feed them like this. So maybe it is, but you know, it's, it's just going to be hard to, uh, Make sure my water stays, you know, stays good. Part of that is all of this water lettuce up top will, you know, help keep my water stable and clean. That's, uh, you know, that's greatly going to, you know, keep my water, you know, uh, more stable for them. And I utilize that, as you can see, in a lot of tanks, I have them covered with water lettuce because it does so much. Well, not in that tank. Uh, that's juvenile marbled craze that like to eat it. But, um... We can look at one more fish. These are my um, multifasciatus, um, what, what's the scientific name? Multifasciatus, um, I kind of forget the full scientific name. Huh, one second. Multifasciatus. Neolamprologus multifasciatus, took me a second, but uh, yeah, Neolamprologus multifasciatus. I've got seven plus in there. Um, got them from my local fish store on sale. Really happy about it. They gave me, so those shells with algae, they actually pulled out from their display tank where they had bred these. So I actually got fry with them. And I think what I had, what I was supposed to get is two males and then the rest females. And um, hopefully that's what I got. Um... And uh, basically, I'm preparing their tank now. They're going to get that 33 long in the living room. I've, uh, I've got to clean some substrate and get that tank set up for them. But uh, eventually, that tank is going to be theirs, and they can just have a, you know, an entire four-foot long tank all to themselves. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, moving on. On to the food part. Ooh, new tank. What's going in there? You... You couldn't guess what's going in there, can you? Guess what's going in there. All right, comments down below. <laughs> um, all right, so for this, uh, this is my brine shrimp hatchery. I'm hatching these out daily, sometimes every other day, depending on how much I feed out. Um, I'm doing a bit of a test here, so I'm feeding a bit more. But um, I roughly put in about two, two and a half, three tablespoons of, of salt. And I also put in a couple teaspoons of Epsom salt and then a small pinch or a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. And I'll actually show you my salt.